No, please, by all means. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, it is working. Um, hello, everyone. This is Jan from Google. He's going to be part of Kubernetes Asia conference. There's apparently about half this conference is that. Um, and you're going to talk about the future involving AI in Kubernetes or something that was quite vague. You, you go do your thing. Yes, yeah, everyone, say hi. It's enjoy. Hi. Um, yeah, it's very, it's very vague, and that's actually um, on purpose um, because yeah, I had the feeling there's already pretty cool Kubernetes talks around in this conference. Um, but I was missing a certain type of talk that is a little bit more maybe architectural and maybe um, talking a little bit more about the ideas. So this is not going to be as fancy as Philippe's stuff and not going to be so humorous, but maybe gives you a few ideas um, around um, Kubernetes. Okay, so let's dive right in because we're a little bit um, behind time. Uh, has, any been to my, uh, has anyone been to my BigQuery workshop this morning? Awesome, cool, thank you very much. So for the ones who haven't been, just very a quick intro what BigQuery is. BigQuery is Google's um, data warehouse. You've just seen Felipe working with that, okay? Um, so what I like about BigQuery is that it actually brings you back to the original spirit of SQL, of having this unified language um, with which you ac can access any type of data and really define an insight you want to have. And that's actually really, really nice. Um, so that's... That's really beautiful if you're coming from like a world where you have to you know, manage database connection strings and stuff. Um, and I was wondering, so what would we have to do to have the same kind of like expressiveness of SQL and a, uh, a magic engine like BigQuery for code, for our applications, right? How would we have to write applications that it becomes as easy as writing an SQL on BigQuery? And that's going to be basically the, the premise of this talk and see, okay, so how could we use Kubernetes to arrive at something like that? Um, spoiler alert, we're not, we're not there yet, <laughs> but, uh, but maybe I can give you a few ideas also to contribute to Kubernetes in the future. Okay, so what's the problem? Why, why can't we um, make that so easily? Well, um, a few of you, I'm a little bit old. Um, I've seen data and logic be coupled. It wasn't a good idea. It didn't work. Um, Lotus Notes and so on, great systems. I actually like them, but uh, didn't scale very well. So this is the wrong route to go. Um, why is this wrong? The, for me, the biggest difference is, um, and there's some nice research done by Nicole Forsgren on that, um, that the development teams are actually most efficient when they're running into a DevOps mode with one common problem, and um, ideally like domain-driven. So, so you have, want to have one small core team and really working and iterating and prototyping on, on code. So that's very different from the way we, um, we work with data. Data is way more, we write a query, run it against a query, so it's way more back and forth, like a conversation. And, code works more collaboratively. So we need to solve that, um, we need to solve that problem. How do we solve that? OSS to the rescue. Um, we've seen really great developments in the, in the open source community that I think guide us a little bit in the right way. Um, I guess most of you have used GitHub. Um, GitHub um, what, when GitHub introduced the fork, it looked a little bit normal. But over the years, we learned that actually social coding is a pretty great idea and that even influenced the whole culture of communities when forks were spawned off and merged back, like the Node.js story, for instance. Um, I really enjoyed to, to follow that, and that's actually a nice way of building, of building applications. If you go one step further, you can even come to systems like Glitch. I'm not sure if anyone knows Glitch here. Um, for them, uh, the fork is the root of everything, and everything just bases up, uh, based itself up on a fork again. And they call it remixes. Really great for beginner coders because you just start with code in the browser and you build up someone else's work and just combine it again in a really fluid way. So that's really, really nice. Um, unfortunately, um, we can't code that way because we need to also be production ready and we can't break for users all the time in production. Um, I worked for Google. I worked in a little bit like an SRE kind of like role. I can tell you on call is not funny if you're being paged five times a night. So, uh, which luckily <laughs> at Google never happened uh, to me, but I, but I got paged a few times, and that's, um, so we want to be production ready. So we need to take this kind of like idea of forking code and actually make it resilient and make it scalable and make it really unified. Um, and what does that actually mean? Well, that very simply means uh, infrastructure as code. Seth um, is going to talk about that tomorrow, but basically what that means is if we only have everything in code, then our systems are predictable. But everything is really hard, right? Because everything means not only the de de definition of our infrastructure, but that means our database should be versioned as well. And that even means our monitoring, our documentation, everything has to be versioned alongside in the same tree. 
That's actually what we're doing in Google. There's a nice talk on that by Rachel Potvin, if you haven't seen that. Uh, we only have one code repository that stores all of that, what I just mentioned, alongside in one head version number. I'm not saying this is the perfect um, idea for everyone, um, but it allows some of those um, methods that I just have mentioned, really um, working with code in a much more fluid, um, organic kind of way. If you do that, um, then you're also automatically kind of like cloud native, because you're actually independent from your underlying infrastructure, and um, you're working on those kind of um, premises, um, and not anymore um, assuming things about your production system that is not defined somewhere else, or just in the heads of like one person somewhere. Um, that's what uh, Chris was talking about this morning. So that's great. Um, so what can we do? What sh how can we arrive there? So if you look at how systems were integrated a um, long time ago, um, this was usually direct, right? Two systems talking to each other, remote procedure call, uh, lookup tables. If you used messaging, then you used something like pipes. Um, then we got a little bit looser coupling. Uh, coupling. Um, we did things like static routing, JNDI, woo, Java 1.3. Um, uh, queues uh, have been around for quite some time and um, then at some point we arrived at like a dynamic routing model and for some time this was basically state of the art so you would have an ESP uh, we still have API management in that direction and we have all kind of routers and that's typically what you still see in most kind of enterprises because that's that brings you this predictability okay um, the problem with this kind of model though is that this predictability and this behavior in the end of your overall system is now defined outside of your system uh, in something else that you don't really control and that always brings a new problem. Some could tell you countless stories where you de deploy to production and oh, s suddenly your message bus is differently configured from the one that was on UAT. Who did that? Oh, I don't know. Uh, some other random person. So um, those kind of problems uh, occur all the time. That makes the systems less predictable and um, with that um, decreases your iteration speed and your product development speed and your, and your mixing flexibility, if you want to call it that way. So in parallel to that, um, we, had, we saw a development of like PubSub patterns, Kafka, um, PubSub generally became a lot more popular, um, and the overall Hollywood principle, asynchronous APIs, and so on and so forth. Um, and in parallel, I'm a big Erlang fan, so I have to mention here uh, agent and stream systems. So this also developed and is maybe the most informal of all of those models of integration. Right? If I have a stream-based system, everything is agent, everything is fluent, and that's great. Um, the only problem with this, these more informal approaches there is um, that the more informal they get, the more complex middleware they need. Right? So Erlang is great, but it's really only running on the Erlang VM. Right? Uh, streams is great, but you need a really, really rigid platform for that. And while this is perfect if you can completely rely on that platform, that will usually or very often cause you to need to integrate systems out of your platform. And then again, you're in this loop of like, well, it's not actually predictable. So let's say, for instance, you have a stream-based system. There's really cool work done by, by Lightband, for instance, the whole reactive manifesto stuff. Um, it's really cool, but then you need a database that runs on that, and you don't have that. So suddenly you have something outside of your system that you need to handle, and with that you bring entropy in. So how can we solve this? How, um, how can we reconcile these, uh, these approaches in, in a better way? Well, Google has been doing a little bit of that for some time, and um, I can explain a little bit about our approach and how that feeds into Kubernetes. So um, I'm not sure if you've ever seen that picture. This was uh, Google's first. Um, REC server. It's actually in the National Museum of American History. It's called the Cork Board Server because those boards are stacked in Cork. So why is that interesting and relevant? If any one of you has seen RECs in the 90s, they look very different. Uh, if you looked at a REC in the 90s, uh, when I was still cabling that kind of stuff myself, um, you would have somewhere like a SAN down there, and then you would have uh, a few pizza boxes doing compute, and then bigger ones uh, that maybe had some backup or disks in there. So you would have all of those, what we sometimes call snowflake servers in there. Um, if you think this is 1999, or I think it was built 1997, um, the basic idea behind that is that from the very, very beginning, for Google, everything was a software problem, right? So um, we didn't have different servers for different types of stuff. And we actually only had two types of servers, compute-heavy machines or storage-heavy machines, and to this day have. And, um, and all the rest was, um, was organized by software. So basically, it was just the role of a motherboard, and that's why everything here 
looks the same, which is actually pretty cool. And this uh, industry standard components, nothing special in there. So this inspired um, how um, we build our architecture. And um, there's two main concepts here. One is containers. In this talk, I kind of assume you a little bit know what a container is, but if you want the one-liner, uh, it's a very light VM-like immutable process isolation. So you can take something, package that in a container, and then the container can run anywhere, but you can do that in a very light way as opposed to a VM. I'm not saying that VMs are bad, VMs are sometimes really great, um, but containers are a little bit more fluid in this whole idea of, of agility. Now, unfortunately, if you have all of those little um, lemmings running around, those containers that die constantly somewhere and, uh, and spread around, you need something to manage that. Uh, Google's approach to manage that was Borg. Um, so Borg is a cluster management system. The biggest difference from Borg to other systems is that it's declarative. So um, you used to, in a cluster management system, say very precisely, these are the servers, that's where it runs, um, and you basically would script something like I like Ansible, for instance, um, so you would have a very clear script of how deployment works, right? Um, Borg is the, actually the other way around. So Borg is actually more of a configuration store. Borg says, uh, dear cluster, we have a new application, say hi application. Um, this application would like to run on 70 servers. Um, it needs um, a quarter CPU on each server and one gigabyte of RAM. Dear servers, uh, please democratically decide between you who takes up this load. But it's a very, very different approach, right? So it's not like a service call, but the servers constantly go back to the central configuration system and say, hey, okay, I have spare resources now. What can I do next? And um, this allows a very, very, um, very, very horizontal scale because in the end, it's actually what we just spoke about, agent systems, the stream system. In the end, it's, a, uh, it's an agent-based system block in itself. So that inspired Kubernetes. Kubernetes is, if you want, the open source third iteration um, of Borg. Um, and is also what's running on the, on the GKE, so the Google Cloud uh, Kubernetes engine. And that's where we're coming back um, to, our, to the title of my talk. I skipped it a little bit in the beginning, but maybe a few of you were wondering, um, what does choreography actually mean? It's such a complicated word. English is not my native language, I can't even pronounce it. So um, the difference to choreography is, if you think about the ESBs, they always talk about orchestration. Orchestration means a conductor is standing in front of an orchestra and telling everyone what to do, right? That scales well up to a point, but at some point it doesn't scale anymore. And um, as I just said, Borg is the opposite. Borg defines rules, and then everyone picks up what they think according to the rules is the best task to do now. And that's what you call choreography. That's like a big dance of everyone, and everyone knows what kind of dance there is, and there is the rhythm of the music around it, and that's how the system acts. So what you're getting is a and I really love this quote um, by, uh, by this paper from, uh, from Burns, uh, Borg, Omega, and Kubernetes, which, which traces this history. Um, you get a desired emergent behavior. So you have to imagine that emergence means something like, you know, like ants. Like all the ants together in itself form an organism, and it's actually more than um, the, uh, the whole system is a lot more than its parts, if you want. And that's the whole idea behind Kubernetes. So this is actually the most important message I wanted to bring across today, that you think of Kubernetes in that way. Not, to, not as a process isolation tool, or not as a um, cluster management system that you just uh, drop into your whatever you have currently, but you have to see it as a way to bring your applications toward this um, fluid way of, um, of building systems. I personally, I come from a um, mobile application background, so I used to always work on like, more uh, cross-platform mobile applications. So very early I did uh, cross-platform stuff, and that's when you saw this whole stream idea really coming in, right? Because you can't just um, use sessions anymore that are cookie-based, and you have different applications where you need to pass on uh, a session or uh, credential information. And at that point, you very early realized, or I back then realized that um, it can only work in a in a um, distributed agent-based system where this kind of information is uh, just part of the system and not a sticky session that's on some like load balancer and if you're lucky, you always get the same request. Okay, so let's go a little bit deeper and um, see um, what, we, um, what we can do with that. I'll do a very quick mini demo. Um, let's hope it really goes fast. Um, I thought in the middle of the talk it's nice to give you a little bit of a <laughs> relaxing 
I uh, from the white background of the slides and just show you very quickly how Kubernetes looks in case you've never seen it before. Again, I don't want to do a Kubernetes course. There's other people who are much better on that um, than I am. So this is, um, okay, yeah, I'll make that a little bit bigger. This is uh, GKE, Google Compute Engine, uh, Kubernetes Engine. And um, you see here, this is a Kubernetes cluster. A Kubernetes cluster is just um, machines. In this case, it's called uh, FOSS Asia Istio. And um, you see this has a cluster size of five. Um, what's interesting here is um, Kubernetes, as you might know, runs on, uh, runs on all infrastructures, right? So this is not a Google feature. You can have the same cluster defined um, on your local machine, on a set of Raspberry Pis. If you've ever seen that Kelsey Hightower's book, I can only recommend that. He has an appendix in that, how to build that in Raspberry Pis. Um, or inside your CI CD system. Um, it's all the same. The cluster is always the same. You just change the configuration a little bit. So if I go into this cluster, um, I, I, see the, I see the machines running in there, um, and I see the nodes. OK, so what I want to do now is this cluster has capacity, so I'd like to run an application. The application is very simple. Um, it's a small, it's just a small web server. Um, I have that hosted on a container registry here. The container registry comes with Google Cloud, um, and all it does is a web server that says, uh, hello for Sager. Okay, so I list that. Okay, great, that thing exists. Great. Um, so um, let me run that server. I type this command here. And what this command does, I could just as well also create a deployment in the UI. Kubernetes is API driven, so I'm just showing you a command line way, but there's other ways to do that. And um, what I'm doing here is, um, dear Kubernetes, run this application from this image. Um, and I want it exposed on port 8080, and I want uh, two replicas of it. Um, this is a very simple command. Um, run means deploy and start. I could also first deploy and then start, do like a rolling um, update, for instance. Um, I can also do auto-scaling. There's like all of those kind of uh, concepts are built into Kubernetes. And then Kubernetes figures out how that works on your platform. But let's take the most simple example now. Um, so I just uh, type that in. And in parallel, I go to workloads in the UI and uh, see what's happening. OK, so awesome. It has uh, created um, this, uh, this deployment. Um, so let me quickly refresh the, the workloads here. And perfect. So here we have it. Um, it's been deployed. You see there's other workloads on the cluster running happily um, on, on other nodes. And actually, already this is already ready. Um, normally, when I do this presentation, I, I show that it's pending. But this time, it was a little bit too fast. So this application is actually running now. Cool. Unfortunately, I can't access it yet because it's not on the internet. It doesn't have an IP. Um, so let's go back and expose this application. And I want to expose it. And if I expose it to the internet, um, I want it behind the load balancer. And again, what this, what this is doing here is um, it basically tells the Google Cloud Platform, uh, please create a load balancer, get a public IP from your pool of public IP addresses, attach it to the load balancer, and call me back once you have that. So let's uh, refresh our deployment here. And let's see that. OK, cool. So we have a service created. That's already good. A service is the Kubernetes name of something that is exposed and, uh, and has a fixed API. Um, and now let's see if we already have an IP. And uh, we have external IP pending. So I have a few more seconds to, uh, to talk about it. So. Um, what is, again, um, what I like here is that you would type the exact same commands on your local machine, right? Doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't matter where you, get your, um, uh, where you get your container from or how big your cluster is. All of that would be the same. Not only commands, these would be the same API calls. The kubectl is just a very small wrapper around the REST API, and you can just use that and build your own UI, and there's lots of UIs for that. Um, what's really nice about the Kubernetes uh, open source project is that right now, um, Google in no way is the main contributor anymore, right? You see lots of other companies really super actively invested in building super interesting stuff. It's a real big ecosystem, and that's also why, um, why it's so, so nice to follow that. In many areas, um, Google doesn't even contribute because they say, hey, there's others who do this a lot better, and it's really nice to see how that, how that develops. Okay, so let's try that again. Perfect, we do have an external IP. 
So, hoping that the network lets me through. I'll just go to that and open this. And if we are lucky, um, so I'm hitting a uh, Go server here. It seems that the network is not letting me through. Okay, yeah, I think we have a firewall issue here, so I can very quickly uh, turn that on my phone. Sorry, give me a second. Port 88 is usually not open. I could have exposed um, actually just a regular SSL as well, thinking about it, but those are the things that you usually discover later. Perfect, and here we are. So, um, as I said, it's a very simple HTTP server. It's not doing much, but it's saying, hello, Force Asia, and so um, that you trust me that this is actually, um, this is actually deployed to Kubernetes. I, um, I output the host name here, and uh, this should be one of the pods that I'm actually running on. Yeah, so that's the second pod that I um, just hit. So you see, it's uh, very, very simple. Um, that's, that's basically all about Kubernetes, and yeah, you have lots of options in there. So, let's go back to our presentation and see how that can help us. Okay, so, um, we've seen this is all very easy, it goes very, very fast, it's really nice. Um, now, we have one problem. Um, the smaller and more heterogeneously interconnected services you build, the harder they actually become to discover and observe. <laughs> Right? This is something that happened that's super interesting. It happened in the microservice community. In the beginning, everyone was like, yay, let's build more services. And suddenly, everyone was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, where, what are all these services doing? <laughs> uh, so it came back a little bit to a classical architecture problem. And as I used to be uh, also more in like tech lead architecture kind of roles, uh, I find that a very interesting problem. So um, let's start a little bit first and see um, what Kubernetes does. So Kubernetes already has some of um, um, best uh, practices baked in. Most of them, for instance, from Google's uh, site reliability engineers, stuff like rolling rollouts and auto-scaling and so on is, is already in there. And as I said before, there is already many, many plugins. So what we can do is we can build something on top of Kubernetes, but on the same layer, right? So we're operating here on an infrastructure layer. So um, why, do, why don't we build something that takes more of those architectural concerns into Kubernetes? And we can do that um, with, um, with a so-called service mesh. Uh, you see here I put the micro service mesh in, in brackets because it's actually not so much about micro, but it's about connecting all the, um, all the services. Um, service meshes are not so new, and there's a few around. I've mentioned uh, Pivotal, the Netflix uh, stack already, for instance. It's a very mature one. Um, the difference to Istio or to service meshes on Kubernetes is, again, they operate one layer lower. So you can have polyglot applications. You can have everything running on that, everything from your, from your database to your Go application to your uh, Java application, and none of them really has to know anything about the service mesh, and that's what makes them um, so interesting. So what kind of service mesh do? Um, it basically wraps your services um, into a sidecar, into uh, a proxy, uh, and that proxy can do all kinds of things. Everything from like instrumentation, suddenly you get um, very, very detailed data about your service interactions. It can do security, um, it can do rollouts, um, it can, for instance, only show features to certain users, all of those kind of things that otherwise you would have to code in your application. And that now, um, again, becomes part of your uh, part of your infrastructure and part of your coded infrastructure, right? So this is something that you can suddenly define now and have in a version system and say this next release is going to be rolled out um, in this rolling update way for those kind of users uh, in your code. And that's something you can just start. And that's, uh, that's really, really nice. Um, what service meshes also allow is much deeper testability. So, uh, Cindy Friedaran is, uh, is the guru here, and uh, she calls that real integration testing. Um, real because you can actually do integration testing in production. So you can do fancy stuff like, for instance, um, take live traffic. You don't want to interrupt your users, but you can actually branch the traffic. You can take the same traffic and direct that through integration tests, and even do that in a, in a secure way. You don't need to store that, or you don't need to, um, you, you don't need to access that data because it just exists. 
Um, you can also um, rerun events that happened in the past. You can also do um, what she calls uh, step up testing. So instead of just running all of that in CI CD, you can make that part of your CI CD chain. So you, you don't just do a D, a continuous deploy, but you say do a continuous deploy to 1%, to a canary, and then to 10%. And, and during those rollouts, you actually measure the impact it has on your infrastructure. Not only on your load, for instance, if your CPUs go up or your uh, RAM goes up, um, but also on the user. Um, do the users experience higher latency? And those kind of uh, metrics actually become part of your CD process. <laughs> Again, because this, it's all in code, right? And it's all in your infrastructure, so there's no, no magic there. Um, what, this, um, what this allows you to do, and uh, Julia Evans is writing a lot about that, um, is it actually forces you to think about SLOs. And um, SLOs here mean real SLOs. Um, in my past, an SLO was typically something like somewhere, somewhere in an architecture document that would say, by the way, we need 99.9% .9 uptime. And that was, that was more or less the SLO. If you're lucky, the customer would define something like, um, we can only have uh, the 95th percentile of requests uh, needs, to, uh, needs to be at the user in like one second, something like this. Well, now, with this deep level um, of, of observability, you can actually have way, way deeper metrics. You can say, I want my power users to see the request in the transaction screen faster than the request in the report screen. And you can actually measure that and again put that into your pipeline. What that does, and that's a nice effect, um, Bridget Chrome uh, uh, wrote a pretty cool paper about that, complex social technical systems are hard or containers will not fix your broken culture. Um, I love that title. Um, what that means is just because you're using containers or Kubernetes, again, um, that doesn't really solve your application problem. What you want is you want to go in this direction and build an application that has defined metrics, that has a defined infrastructure that actually solves the user problem. And suddenly you can start arguing about that because you do have the metrics, you have the numbers to go to your stakeholders, to go to your business and say, well, I actually know what that costs. Yeah, you want that feature, that's cool. But do you know that costs us 100 CPUs every month? Um, those kind of arguments become a lot more interesting. And that's, for instance, something um, we, we also do uh, internally at Google. So that's, um, that's really, really nice. So what are the uh, benefits? I found this really nice uh, quote in a book by Molly Wright Stevenson from Ken Beck, who once said, uh, patterns are rearrangements of power in the de design process. What that means is if you own the patterns, if you define how we code, if you define the building blocks of our application, um, then you define the product. And in the end, that's all we want to do. I'm not sure about you, but I'm a software engineer and I, um, I really like to be on the same level with my stakeholders and with my product manager, for instance, right? I, I really want to have a real argument about the, about the business value. And that's what those patterns that are baked into something like Istio and to the architectural abilities um, allow you to do. You can start growing evolutionary. That's the reason why I just removed the brackets from the word micro because that's something I never liked about the word microservice, that it somehow prescribes a size. I've seen very big services that were just a really, really close business problem, but super complex. So let them be super complex and um, start refactoring them and splitting them over time. You can do all of those kind of things because you can define now the API and you can define which services are behind those, those API. Your consumer might not even realize that suddenly they are served by three or four microservices now because it's still going through the same uh, through the same API. You can start playing um, with semantics, whether you want to use events or calls, right? Um, right now, you always have to choose if you either have RPC models, like um, you're calling something, or whether you want to send an event to a bus. Well, maybe you can try both and see what, uh, what works better. Or you can integrate service catalogs, service brokers, external integrations. If you do that, you can also bridge the boundary um, to functions. So you might have realized that I haven't mentioned functions yet in this talk. Why is that the case? Uh, in case you haven't heard about functions, or sometimes called serverless, um, functions are a, like almost like a pass, almost like a higher level than a, than a pass. It's something you call and you don't care about um, the deployment at all. So that's great. Um, for instance, for IoT uh, use cases, um, functions are really nice, but in larger product developments, you would typically see that you need some kind of control over your architecture. 
but you still want the advantage of functions. Well, now you can combine that. There is actually function uh, frameworks based on top of Kubernetes and on top of Istio um, that can give you that flexibility, but you can combine it now in one architecture and you actually know which part is doing what. You don't need two separate worlds and change the team and suddenly have a red flag or a blue flag on your, on your table, um, whether you're for functions or against functions. Um, right now, not all service meshes support that in a really nice way, um, but there is super interesting work to be done. You might have realized I'm using a lot of references in this application. That's really because so much is happening that sometimes it's just better to follow the people on Twitter or in blogs. Um, but um, there's definitely some interesting things happening. Um, Kubeless, DCOS, Riff are uh, projects which are playing with this breaking up those kind of like semantics. And um, yeah, if you want to have a look at that, um, do. As I just said in the slide before, you can also start really observing behavior. And um, JBD, for instance, uh, she mentions a lot about um, that in, um, in her blog post about observability. Um, because you can really start looking um, at services on a trace level. I remember when like maybe five years ago we started um, in including trace IDs in our requests and uh, it was such a simple hack but suddenly you had such an insight into your system how your users are actually using it. Um, this was something we never had before and that's um, something um, that really drives product decisions and drives um, reasoning about products um, a lot better than reasoning about some abstract SLAs. Right? Um, and if you have all of that, last but not least, and that's where I come back to my experience also in troubleshooting, um, you also can now reconcile your application metrics with your infrastructure metrics, like loads and CPU and, and memory. Uh, yeah, because in the end, someone is responsible for that, right? Um, there will always be some form of more ops-focused people, but they can now go to the application and say, hey, uh, excuse me, <laughs> you're using up a lot of RAM, you're using up a lot of CPU, and I know it's exactly you, and I can even show you the piece in your code where that happens, and by the way, I know how to make it better. And that's, that's ideally what you, what you actually want. And I can only say again, this actually happens a lot um, um, internally. Um, if you want to know more about that, there are some really, really cool talks by Liz Fong-Jones. I, um, I can only recommend you to listening whatever she said in her whole life, um, because there's really cool insights also how, sh uh, how she shows uh, internal tools in Google um, to do those kind of like drill downs and find misbehaving code that maybe only misbehaves in a certain condition in a certain data center um, under a certain type of load, and that's really nice. Cool. Um, that's actually my, my main slide. So let's uh, wrap up here a little bit. So what can we, what can we do beyond that? Um, if we have all the information, we can start reasoning on an architectural level. This is, for instance, a service graph that is uh, produced inside Istio, um, which is a service mesh based on Kubernetes. Um, that's really interesting. That generates you the relationships of your services based on the traffic between them. So not what you define somewhere or what someone says. Um, this process is uh, sometimes called process mining um, that actually shows you how your system is used. And um, that can be pretty surprising. All of us know that. You wonder like, wow, so many people are using my app. What are they doing with it? And then you actually look at the logs and they're doing, using it for something completely different from what you have thought. And um, those systems can now just give that to you for free. And you even see that live. You can even break that down by users and say, what type of users are using which kind of interactions? And um, with that, your ops role, or your, we call it the SREs, they become way more architects than ops. And that I really like. I used to be an architect, and I had to, the, the problem that I always felt like I have no grip on the code. Um, because uh, in, in old companies, the architect is the guy on the PowerPoint, and then the uh, guy or girl on the PowerPoint, and then, um, yeah, you unfortunately want to somehow, you have to ask the coders and they just say, oh, I don't want to use that library and I don't want to do those connections. Sorry? Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, and uh, now you actually have that handle. Now you're coming from this ops perspective, from the architecture perspective, and um, suddenly you can actually argue with the developers and really change it and really say, this is how you want to change it. And this goes a little bit back to what Felipe showed before uh, in, in GitHub. If you have access to all of that code, you can actually change it. So I'm going a little bit faster now. Um, here you see some, some more um, references. Um, Charity Majors is the, is the one you want to look up for this kind of like observing events and mapping them to domain logic. Uh, she has some awesome talks in that as well. And just one last statement, because you mentioned it in the beginning. <laughs> um, AI becomes, of course, a natural collaborator. Now you have all of this data. 
Now, obviously, you can just um, route that into a statistical model. There's always the example that Google saved 40% of its energy, and that's a lot of energy, um, by having all the data center um, usage data fed into a machine learning model that came back and suggested how to change the power uh, configurations, right? So why not do that to your software? Why not see, okay, which services are calling each other? And actually, isn't there, is there maybe users which always end up in this node? Why not expose that directly to the user instead of going via five steps? That's just, that's just churn. Um, so that's um, really, really interesting. So to summarize, um, what you want to do is you want to do domain-driven polyglots so and multiple languages evolutionary mixed semantics development with all the standards. That's proven to be the most productive way that developers work and, by the way, also the happiest way. Uh, I find it great when I build something that actually has a product impact and I see how users like it. Um, you can suddenly have a real quality telemetry view on your system. Michael Feathers is doing a lot of that work, for instance. Um, they have some awesome analysis on tech debt. Uh, so they can basically say which code is so old that it makes your whole application slow. Um, awesome talks, uh, really, really funny how they drill down into um, who, who caused the tech debt and how that's fixed in, uh, in service meshes. You can focus on risk and user experience rather than infrastructure or process boundaries. You don't have to just say I need 99.5% availability. You can actually say, like in an you know, eventual consistent database, um, you can just say, oh, well, in this screen, that's how I want the application to behave. And maybe in this one, it should rather behave consistently and fast and in the other one not. And um, you as developers, um, you can cool stuff like automated refactorings. Because if everything, if your whole application is there, well, everyone can fork it. And it can happen that the other team comes and say, hey, you didn't do a good job. I take your whole application, including the infrastructure, including the database, everything, and just deploy it on my own. And then I fix the code for you, and then I show you it is better. And that's actually something that's really cool and fun. And um, yeah, it's in the end the true spirit of open source. And with that, thank you very much. Sorry, I don't think we have time for questions. <laughs> sorry. sorry, I was looking at the um, at the little counter. Yeah, sorry, but it's actually five minutes behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, I sorry, that's that. why I no reminded you. Yep. Um, so, well, yeah. Um,